Hello and welcome, my name is Meeplus, they, she, he, and this is Literally Graphic. And today is my 2022 third quarter, not comics, reading wrap up, where I talk about all the books I read that are not comics. 99.9% .9 of these are audiobooks, which I think are valid. So there, at least this time you'll be watching me attempt to start a drawing habit rather than me noodling through Minecraft. Let me know below which is your preference. First off, I read 25 books this quarter. Again, so that was nice. Average pages per book ticked up slightly to 327.83. And for better or for worse, the average publication date moved back forward to 2009, closer to the first quarter date of 2014 than the second quarter date of 1982. Then my first graph ticked up just a smidge with seven goal reads this quarter over six last. I continue to lag a bit on that, but I'm still within 10 books of the year goal, so I think I might just make it. Currently, the plan is to possibly do a re-listen slash finish a listen of all of Garth Nix's work. It wasn't my first choice, but I do want to finish this goal, and there seems to be limited audiobook choices. As usual, I'll be talking about some of my thoughts and reasons for picking up each book in order of lowest rated to highest rated, followed by stats. Plus, I'll continue to highlight some of the diverse medias I have been picking up from my goal region of Oceana. Then we shall move into the rest of my graphs, plus timestamps should be included. Starting with my apparently ever-growing list of unrated knuckle reading, first off we have Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. I originally picked this book up last year and just never got around to finishing it. I've generally been meaning to read all of Dickens' work for like the past decade, although I haven't been making a whole lot of progress recently. Nickleby was interesting, I was struck by his horrible school experience, as this seems to have been something that England seems to have really invested in developing deadly schools for inconvenience children and then exported them to all their colonies along with any children they could get their hands on. But I digress. The second unrated book this quarter was actually my last read of the quarter, Fair Play by Eve Rodsky. I picked this book up because it came up with KC Davis ADHD cleaning TikTok channel and it wasn't disappointing. I'm kind of torn because it was encouraging me to turn more of my personal life into project management, which I could see the pluses for, but I kind of feel like I might be in the wrong on that one. Also, while I appreciate Rodsky's playing lip service to the fact that this system could work for all kinds of couple gender combinations, probably because Rodsky is married to a man who was taking less responsibility for housework, her book mostly follows the heterosexual cliches slash tropes. Moving into actually starred reads, I had a pretty highly rated quarter with only one not goal book coming in at two stars. This particular book was The Vampire Lestat by Anne Rice. I continue to find this series a bit of a slog. I'm here for camp and here from any number of other things that render genre books less than desirable. I'm apparently not here for Rice's vampires. Ticking up one star, we have Good Omens, the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman that I rated three stars for now. I picked this up because I've been slowly working my way through some of Pratchett's books for the first time and Good Omens comes up a lot in the fandom spaces I frequent. It's not that I took particular offense to anything in Good Omens, mostly that it sort of bounced off me entirely. I'm interested in also watching the TV series and see if that connects with me a bit more. I've certainly enjoyed similar books and movies in the past and a lot of my friends do really love this one in particular. Jumping up up to four out of five stars. First off, I read Iron Widow by Ziren J. Zhao, a young adult science fiction novel. I certainly picked it up because of the hype, and I have to say it did not disappoint, and I would highly recommend. Then I finally read The 1619 Project, a new origin story by Nicole Hannah-Jones, a very divisive book. It's clearly very good, and a really necessary reframing of the origins of the genocidal slave-dependent state that is the so-called USA. Not that so-called Canada is much better. Next up, we have Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt, which I have actually recommended to a couple people IRL. I wasn't sure what to expect from this book when I picked it up because it was a book club read. Not that I'm succeeding in keeping up with slash participating in said book club, sigh. 
but it definitely left a very positive impression. Fourth in order was The Only by Catherine Applegate, the final book in the middle grade Endling trilogy, perhaps a bit rushed at the very end. I really love this trilogy and would recommend it to anyone interested in middle grade fantasy. I picked these books up because they were covered by Animorphs Anonymous podcast. Next up is Front Lines by Michael Grant, spouse and oft collaborator of Applegate who I have not read previously. Next, another out-of-sync book club read was Habin, The Deafblind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law by Habin Gurma. Looking at other people's reviews, I was a bit surprised that many seemed to not appreciate that the book was a series of personal vignettes as we move through Gurma's life rather than feeling I was reading disconnected chunks. I really felt like Gurma was focusing on points in her life to highlight the differences that set her life apart as a deafblind person and illustrate her problem-solving skills. I appreciated the opportunity to get such an intimate perspective on a life and learn so much that I didn't even realize I didn't know before picking up this book. Four star books number six and seven are both by Akweki Amezi. I hadn't planned it out this way, but I happened to pick up both Bitter and You Made a Fool of Death at the same time. Both proved extremely interesting and entertaining and very Amezi. Although I did miss that Bitter was a prequel for a minute. I pick up a new Amezi book automatically, and while they aren't for everyone, I've never been disappointed. Next up, we have Run Towards the Danger by Sarah Polly. I picked this one up for a Reading Toronto Award thing, and it was pretty interesting. The Gomeshi trial happened fairly early in my time here, and so while it wasn't nice to revisit it, it was interesting for lack of a better term. Polly writes about a lot of other stuff, including her recovery from a traumatic brain injury and growing up as a child actor, and those things were even more interesting. And to wrap up this tier, we have Just Your Local Bisexual Disaster by Andrea Masquada. I can't remember exactly how this got on my TBR, but it was as fun as the title suggested, which was very. Solidarity forever. Jumping up to five out of five stars, the play Two Indians by Phelan Johnson was my first first five-star read of the quarter. The only play I read this quarter, it was another pickup for the Toronto reading thing. Not that I read anywhere close to all of the long list, but it was extremely good in my opinion and very interesting. Next up, we have Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis, a book of abolitionist theory that I had wanted to pick up for a long time, but only just had access to as an audiobook my preferred means of consuming ideas. So that was nice to finally dig into. Not an abolitionist expert by any means, but it's one of my areas of strong interest. The current system on my side of the pond is certainly not working. Thirdly, we have the poetry collection Daylight by Roya Marsh, a bit of a random pickup in a medium that I don't read very often, but it really drew me in, to say the least. And finally, the second to last book I read this quarter was Sorrowland by River Solomon because it was written by River Solomon. Another really impressive writer of speculative fiction, this story took a lot of turns I was not expecting and proved to be a lot more than I expected. Which concludes my not goal reading for the corridor. As far as movie watching from Down Under, I haven't looked back at my video from last quarter, but I feel like there was less. That said, I did end up watching The Quiet Earth from 1985, directed by... Jeff Murphy? I forget how I heard of it, but it proved to be an entertaining enough take on Last Man on Earth, futuristic power grids, and empty New Zealand suburbs. It's averaging a well-deserved 3.5 stars out of 5 on Letterboxd. Then I also picked up Kim.com, Caught in the Web, by New Zealand director Annie Goldson. I hadn't thought about this guy in a while, so it was interesting enough to get this 2017 update on the legal stuff. It's fairly well-deserved. Average was 3.3 out of 5 on Letterboxd. Slightly less inspired choices than previously, but here you have it. On to the goal reads. Even higher rated on average, my lowest rated goal read this quarter was Aunties, number two, Four Aunties in a Wedding by Jesse Q. Sutanto, which was a lot of fun, but did not quite hold up to the first book in the series, Dial A for Aunties. That was actually my very first read of the quarter, in which I ended up rating four out of five stars. Ridiculous, but also ridiculously fun. But as some of you will know, Sutanto is from Jakarta in Indonesia, which is actually part of Asia. But as I must sheepishly admit every time this comes up, when I did my year focused on Asia, being an ignorant American, I, I thought that surely Indonesia was part of Oceania. 
Obviously it is not. But I also wanted to pick up books from Indonesia at some point, so I decided now was as good a time as ever. So it's a goal read. I also read Insurrecto by Gina Apostol, born in the Philippines, which I did not end up writing, a work of literary fiction I didn't quite have enough context to fully appreciate what was going on every step of the way, so it seemed a bit presumptuous to slap a star rating on it. Then we circled back to Australia with Too Much Lip by Melissa Lukashenko, a queer and contemporary piece of literary fiction, four stars. But now on to the five stars, of which there were three. First, we had Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Ribby, Published in 2019, it is categorized as a contemporary work of young adult fiction, a coming-of-age story about a Filipino-American teenager trying to uncover the truth of his cousin's murder. Secondly, we have Redefining Realness by Janet Mock, which I initially did not realize was going to be a goal read, but I think, again, if you circled back to my original goal video, I was including Pacific Islands, and what I discovered in reading Redefining Realness, Janet Mock is of both black and native Hawaiian descent and was born on the island, and thus proved to be an interesting and unique facet of life from the island of Hawaii, one of the annexed parts of so-called United States that I have read the least amount of literature from. Then we have Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World by Tyson Yunkaporta. Quote, Tyson Yunkaporta is an academic, an art critic, and a researcher who is a member of the Appalache clan in far north Queensland. He carves traditional tools and weapons and also works as a senior lecturer in indigenous knowledge at Deakin University in Melbourne. He lives in Melbourne. End quote. An extremely interesting book to say the least and one I had been trying to get to all year. Which is all the not comics I read this quarter. On to statistics. In series versus standalone, I read seven of the latter and 18 of the former. That's pretty average for standalones and slightly higher for series. Genre wise, I read eight nonfiction, nine contemporary, six science fiction fantasy, one poetry, and one play. Obviously, these numbers fluctuate a lot, but all within a pretty average range. Looking at target demographic, I continue to read Zero Kidlet this year, but I read twice as much YA this quarter as any other quarter. Authors on the general Marxist side of things is a bit down this quarter, but I think reading any at all will put me above last year overall. Authors who identify as being outside of the mainstream assumed to be totally able-bodied crowd were up a bit this quarter, which is excellent. Looking at the racial ID of authors this past quarter, I read eight books by black authors, eight from white, three from indigenous authors, and six from authors of color. A much more even split than last quarter, which is good. Looking at religious statistics, the relative dominance of people influenced by Christianity continues with a dash of Odinon, Judaism, indigenous spirituality, atheist, and Scientology mixed in. Part of this does boil down to how few people openly discuss their faith backgrounds or current beliefs, but I need to try and do better. Looking at gender, I got a much better spread than usual with 16 women authors, four male authors, and five beyond the gender binary authors, with at least five of these people also identifying as trans in some way. Six of these authors were also out as part of the queer community, and 19 authors are unknown. Of course, some of these are probably just straight, but people generally don't come out as straight. So I don't want to assume things and pigeonhole them. This quarter, I do not appear to have read any translated work, but I did manage to read a decent number of books with international connections. Reads from so-called America were up slightly, from so-called Canada was slightly down, UK was higher than usual, and I read two each from the Philippines, Indonesia, India, Igbo, and Australia, with seven countries or people groups that I only read one book from this quarter, including, and part of my pronunciation, Haudenosaunee, Bunjilung, China, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Hui, and Wick peoples. And that's all they wrote. Bye y'all, keep reading an organized and capitalist depression. And as always, Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.